What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network. Here, continuing our reading of the Bitcoin Optech Group newsletter. Thank you very much to all the funding sponsors and associates uh, of this great organization. Today, newsletter number 38, on March 19th, 2019. This week's newsletter gives an update on the planned removal of BIP61 reject messages from Bitcoin Core. It links to further discussions about Sikash no input unsafe. It analyzes some new features in the Explorer blockchain explorer, provides the information about an, update, an updated node ban list, and links to videos of talks at the recent MIT Bitcoin Club Expo. Also provided are a new weekly section about the adoption of BEC32 sending support and the normal list of code, notable code changes in popular Bitcoin infrastructure projects. Starting with the action items, help test Bitcoin Core version 0.18 release candidate 2. The second release candidate for the next major version of Bitcoin Core has been released. Testing is still needed by organizations and experienced users who plan to run the newest version of Bitcoin Core in production. Use this issue for reporting feedback. News. BIP61 reject messages. As summarized in last week's newsletter, several developers complained about BIP61 reject messages being disabled by default in the upcoming Bitcoin Core version 0.18 especially since the notice of this was only given shortly before the planned release. Bitcoin Core developers discussed the issue and decided to re-enable BIP61 by default for the 0.18 release, but describes it as depreciated in the release notes. They plan to disable it by default in 0.19, expected around October 2019, and probably remove it either then or at some later point. The mailing list moves. As announced on each list, the Bitcoin DEF and Lightning DEF mailing list will be moving to groups.io discussion hosting services in the near future. The list will remain oper operable uh, at the current addresses until the migration is complete, at which point subscribers should receive a notification. If you don't want groups.io to learn your subscriber information, you should unsubscribe from the list immediately. You do not need to create a groups.io account at this time. More discussion about Sikash no input unsafe. Anthony Towns started another thread about ensuring the proposed no input Sikash mode is hard to misuse in ways that could result in loss of funds. No input can enable an alternative on-chain enforcement layer for Lightning Network that's more suitable for channels with multiple participants, ultimately allowing a greater number of channels to be opened in the same amount of block space. Towns describes a reasonably plausible worst-case scenario where failure to ensure no input safety puts adoption on of other valuable protocols features at risk. To avoid that happening, he, pro he proposes refinements to earlier ideas about output tagging, see newsletter 34, and a new alternative that would require every transaction with a signature that uses no input to also contain a signature that does not use no input. This would prevent third parties from executing replay attacks without or with no input transactions. But it would mean that the most efficient use of Taproot could be used and so would result in moderately large transaction sizes when no input was being used. A Explorer update. Nadva Ivki announced an update of this open source blockchain explorer. See our coverage of its initial release in November uh, in newsletter 25. Unconfirmed transactions are now displayed with an estimate of how long it will take them to confirm given current network conditions or an overpayment warning if, the pay, if they pay more than necessary to be confirmed quickly. 
perhaps more notably, the details view for both confirmed and unconfirmed transactions provides an analysis of the feature and anti-features used or omitted from the transaction. For example, use of SegWit, address reuse, inconstant output precision, matching an unnecessary input heuristic, inconsistent input or output script types, and changeless transactions. After seeing the new changes, Ryan Havar raised some concerns on Reddit about the, possible, uh, the possibly high rates of false positive privacy warnings, leading uh, to him opening an issue in the Explorer's GitHub about the problem. Attempting to address these concerns, Ifki started a conversation with several Bitcoin Core developers. Privacy advocates may wish to review this conversation, with, uh, which covers topics such as Gregory Maxwell and Peter Woolley believe that Bitcoin Core would occasionally match unnecessary input heuristics uh, since the release of Bitcoin version 0.1 in 2019, 2009 with increasing frequency in more recent releases, making this heuristic less useful than hypoth hypothesized uh, for distinguishing between commercial services and end-user wallets. Bitcoin Core's coin selection updates over the past two releases allow it to frequently produce transactions without change outputs. These transactions are more efficient and more privacy-preserving than transactions with change, but Esplora currently displays them in red as privacy-leaking transactions because they also match the pattern of, uh, of the user using a max send feature uh, to send all their bitcoins from one wallet to another wallet or exchange. Maxwell proposed that a useful addition to the privacy analysis would be identifying when a user controlled multiple UTXOs received to the same address, but only send a transaction spending a subset of those UTXOs. This behavior makes it possible to connect later transactions spending those UTXOs to earlier transactions, which is destroying privacy. Overall, it's great to see developers building tools that help people identify flaws in their software or their behavior, but it's also important to consider how users will interact with these tools. As Wooly said near the end of the conversation, I'm sure happy that there is a decent explorer for now, and now for debugging stuff out there, but I'm concerned about making it sound like it's an actual production tool. I know people will use explorers, and one that gives good information is better than one that confuses everything. But really, we should not encourage using it. If this privacy detection feature causes people to go look up all their transactions because of a gamification, like feeling, oof, let's see how my transaction did here, it's probably a net negative. The most important thing is to put a block explorer is warning. Look up your own addresses on a block explorer. Leaks your privacy to the site operator. Very important notice. Spy node ban list updated. Some IP addresses are performing various attacks that are likely aimed at monitoring transaction propagation so that they can attempt to determine which node originated which transactions. To help node operators refuse connecting to those IP addresses, Gregory Maxwell maintains a ban list that can be imported into Bitcoin Core and compatible nodes. There is absolutely no need to use this centralized list. Your fully decentralized node will attempt to connect to a diverse enough set of peers that it should establish at least one honest connection. But using this ban list may reduce the amount of traffic you waste on spy nodes and other bad actors. The list comes in two form formats. One is to use for the command line with Bitcoin CLI, and one can be pasted into the debug console of the Bitcoin Core GUI. The blacklist IP addresses are banned for one year, and Bitcoin Core will remember the ban uh, between restarts. So you only need to import the list once. Note, 
Some users have reported that the ban list may exceed the maximum buffer size of the GUI on some platforms, requiring pasting it in chunks of about 250 entries, each in order to load the whole list. The MIT Bitcoin Club 2019 Expo videos are available. A series of talks from the exposition two weeks ago have been split into individual videos and uploaded to YouTube. We've heard that many of the talks were excellent, so consider browsing the playlist for topics that sound interesting to you. BEC32 Sending Support, Week 1 of 24. BEC32 Native SegWit Addresses were first publicly proposed almost exactly two years ago, becoming the BIP 173 standard. This was followed by the SegWit soft fork login on the 24th of August 2017. Yet, 17 months after login, some popular wallets and services still do not support sending Bitcoin to BAC32 addresses. The developers of other wallets and services are tired of waiting and want to default to receiving payments to back 32 addresses so that they can achieve additional fee savings and improve privacy. Bitcoin Optech would like to help this process along so. From now on, the two-year anniversary of SegWit login, each of our newsletters will include a short section with resources to help get back 32 sending support fully deployed. Note, we are only direct, directly advocating back 32 sending support. This allows the people you pay to use SegWit, but it does not require you to implement SegWit yourself. If you want to use SegWit yourself to save fees or access it, other benefits, that's great. We just encourage you to implement back 32 sending support first so that the people you pay can begin taking advantage of it immediately while you upgrade the rest of your code and infrastructure to fully support SegWit. To that end, this week's section focuses on showing exactly how small the difference is between sending to a legacy address and sending to a back 32 address. So sending to a legacy address. For a pay to public key hash legacy address that you already support, such as this one address, your base 58 check library will decode that into 20 byte commitment, which is this here. The commitment is inserted into the script pubkey template with op dupe, op hash 160, op push 20, which pushes these 20 bytes, and op equal verify and op checksec. Converting the opcode to hex format looks like this right here. This is inserted into the script pubkey part of the output that also includes the length of the script, which is 25 bytes and the amount being paid. Uh, so we have here in this part, the amount, and then we have here the script pubkey uh, with some additional uh, checksums. This output can then be added to the transaction, uh, which is then signed and broadcast. Now sending to a BEC32 address, for an equivalent BEC32 pay to witness public key hash address, such as this BC1Q address, you can use one of the reference libraries to decode the address to a pair of values, uh, which is zero and this hash right here. These two values are also inserted into the script pubkey template. The first value is the witness script version byte, and that is used to add value to the stack using one of the opcodes uh, from op0 to op16. The second is the commitment that that's also pushed onto the stack. Uh, so in total, we have again op0, op push 20, and then this commitment. Converting the opcode to hex looks like this. Then, just as before, this is inserted into the script pubkey as part of an output. Uh, as we see here, the amount and again the script pubkey. But the size here is only 22 bytes. Uh, compared to 25 bytes of the legacy transactions. This output is added to the transaction, and the transaction is then signed and broadcasted. For each BEC32 pay-to-witness script hash, the SegWit equivalent of pay-to-script hash, 
or for the future Sankvit witness versions. You don't need to do anything special. The witness script version may be a different number, requiring you to use the corresponding op0 to op16 opcodes. And the commitment may be a different length, up to 40 bytes, but nothing else changes. What you see above is the entire change you need to make to the backend of your software in order to enable sending to back 32 addresses. For most platforms, it should be a very easy change. Uh, see BIP 173 and the reference implementations for a set of test vectors that you can ensure your implementation works correctly. And next up, we have the notable code and documentation changes uh, this week in Bitcoin Core, LND. C Lightning, Eclair, Lipsack P256 K1, and the Bitcoin Improvement proposals. This LND change allows the creation of the hold invoices. Uh, these are the standard Lightning Network invoices that are pro processed differently when the payment is received. Instead of the receiver immediately returning the payment pre image in order to claim the paid funds. The receiver delays up until the maximum allowed by the payment time lock. This allows the receiver to accept or reject the payment subsequent to knowing that the money is available. For example, Alice could automatically generate hold invoices to her website, but wait until a customer actually paid before searching uh, her inventory for the request item. This would give her the chance to cancel the payment if she could not deliver. Other examples use cases are provided in the pull request's main description. This LND change implements most of the code necessary for an initial version of the Watchtower client support that will allow a Lightning Network node to pair with a private Watchtower to send it encrypted state backups. The Watchtower can monitor the blockchain for attempted channel contract breaches and submit the breach remedy, the justice transaction, that prevents the honest party from losing funds. See the notable code changes section of our previous newsletters of coverage on the, of the commitment implementation of the server side Watchtower changes. And these are newsletters 7, 19, 22, and 30. And we have this C Lightning change, which adds a new set channel fee RPC that allows the user to set the fee rate for each of their channel individually. And peers, you got to subscribe to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter, which is, of course, a awesome, awesome organization that provides a awesome wealth of knowledge. Uh, so thank you very much to the contributors. And thank you for subscribing to the Bitcoin Optech newsletter and the World Crypto Network. Pierce, see you on the next show. Bye-bye.